Bye. <laughs> just give it a moment because um, everyone's just kind of joining in bit by bit. Well done, Alex. There's a lot of pressure on you with the technology this morning. I know. <laughs> it's it's already not going as I expected. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. So, um, yeah, the the main thing will be uh, once we get started properly, just to um, have everyone on mute so we don't have like a hundred different people's background noise. Yeah, because the dog's not really all that quiet. Yeah, <laughs> dogs and kids and partners who are in and all sorts. So yeah, at least if it's, uh, if it's on other people's videos rather than mine, that'll be uh, that'll be something at least. Um, got, got some more people that I just need to let in as well. Okay, that's excellent. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Right, okay, I think now we've got um, pretty much everyone in. Um, a few more people coming in, so I'm just gonna keep um, clicking admit. Um, so I think um, I should have everyone muted. I think I've done it so that you can't unmute yourselves now, so we should be um, ready to go and not get any background noise and stuff. Um, so, First of all, um, welcome and thank you for joining our first ever webinar. You'll be able to tell it's our first one due to the uh, technical stuff that I'm making up as I go. Um, so we've got a really nice mix of people joining today from um, charities around the UK and a few a bit further afield as well. Um, and while some of you are going to know us really well already, um, there are some of you that I think have probably never heard of us before um, seeing the webinar being promoted. Um, so just to introduce us really briefly, um, at Keda Consulting we help charities like yours to raise the funding you need to make a difference in the world. Um, we do this through helping you develop the right fundraising strategy, through securing grant funding, um, developing new fundraising income streams, through interim support and we undertake a range of strategic consulting assignments as well. Um, so if you want to find out a bit more about us, um, you can check out the website another time. Um, but I'm keen to um, get cracking today. Just going to let a few more people in. Um, so today we're talking about um, emergency fundraising communications, um, particularly as a result of the COVID-19 situation um, that we're all facing at the moment. Um, so we're joined today as well by Anna Featherstone, who's Head of Fundraising and Comms at the MPS Society, um, and Matt Cottleshaw, who has the same role at the Bone Cancer Research Trust. Um, so Matt and Anna are going to share their experiences um, of communicating with their supporters um, during this crisis. Um, they're going to let us know what they've been doing how, why, what the results have been, um, and hopefully what they've learned um, along the way. Um, so I'm going to share a few of my own thoughts first, and then we'll hear from Anna and Matt, and then we'll have time for some Q&A. Um, so as, as things come to you, please just post your questions in the chat function. Um, my colleague Amy is going to keep an eye on that and collate them for us, um, and then we'll um, get through as many as we can. Um, in the time that we've got. So, um, yeah, it's a crazy time for all of us, that's for sure. Um, and I think definitely communicating with your supporters at the moment is, is probably more, more important now than ever. Um, now, you've probably noticed that we've not used the, the word appeals so far. We're talking about emergency fundraising communications, um, which may or may not include an urgent funding appeal within them. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about Marie Curie running Facebook ads and reaching millions of people here. You know, for most smaller charities, that sort of thing's not going to work. Um, you're going to get lost in the noise of those kind of bigger brand names. Um, but what you definitely, um, you know, you don't want to be staying quiet either. You definitely need to be communicating with your supporters. Um, these are the people that already care about your cause and you know people are looking for ways to help and ways to do something positive at the moment 
Um, we're seeing that in all sorts of ways through um, people helping out vulnerable neighbours, through people getting involved in the more kind of formal volunteering initiatives, helping the NHS and um, local food banks and so on. Um, and through the success of the various kind of fundraising appeals that we've seen, um, both in terms of those kind of very high profile public appeals that we're seeing, um, but also in terms of individual charities of all sorts of shapes and sizes um, that are getting, and they're get, getting their communications right um, and, and asking their, their supporters if they can help at this time. Um, and of course, while some people won't be in a position to at the moment, um, you know, lots of people can do something and they really want to do something. Um, and that's, you know, that's helping with their own well-being to, you know, get that kind of buzz of, of being able to help for people that are more vulnerable than themselves. Um, so the, the key thing really, as I say, is that it's that communication. Um, and I think it's covering three key points. And that's really, you know, what the impact has been on your beneficiaries specifically. So you know, we're all facing challenging times, but for the people that you support, um, you know, what is it particularly, um, what's the kind of specific challenge for them at the moment and, and why they're particularly vulnerable or whether they're at a higher risk or whether it's to do with their mental health or, or whatever the particular challenge might be. Um, and then looking at how you're adapting as an organisation, you know, how are you um, needing to adapt your services um, what's the impact been on your own staff and volunteers and how you're supporting them um, and what's the financial impact been you know if you lost trading income fundraising event income um, are you incurring additional costs in terms of how you're supporting people at the moment um, and really getting that across and, and getting that statement out there um, and then what we've been doing is to, to take that kind of key information and then adapt it into communications for different types of audiences. So for example, for your grant funders, you would probably make quite a direct ask having set out that explanation and then saying, you know, this is how much income we've lost. This is what it costs to provide support at the moment. And, you know, a very clear kind of financial ask of them. Um, if you're communicating with individual supporters, it's much more likely to be, um, well, I mean, it, in some cases that your supporters and your beneficiaries will have a significant overlap and so some have chosen not to make appeals to that, that part of their supporter base. Um, but if you do, it's much more likely to be a kind of um, an acknowledgement that they might be in a challenging situation themselves. Um, and if they can't help at this time, that that's okay, and you appreciate their ongoing support um, and wishing them well. Um, but if if they are able to support, um, to show that you know that, that any donation at the moment is going to make a really big difference to the the people you support. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Anna first of all, um, so we can hear about the um, experience that um, Anna and the MPS Society have had. Um, so I've unmuted you, Anna. Um, so if you want to start, um, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, my name is Anna, um, Head of Fundraising and Commons at MPS Society, like Alex said. Um, so we're a small charity. Um, we support anyone affected by um, a rare genetic and life-limiting disease. Um, there's 25 called um, MPS um, and basically the charity is all about supporting those who are affected by offering guidance. Um, we arrange expert meetings um, and we bring families together and have kind of really fun days out um, because unfortunately there's no cure for these conditions. Um, and so our supporter base, we only have about 1500 members, so the members are the people that actually have one of our diseases. And then the wider network, we have around um, 8,000 people on our database, so that's made up of sort of parents, grandparents, friends, siblings, companies, you name it. Um, but out of that, I would say we probably only have about two, two and a half thousand people that are warm to us. So relatively small um, database. Um, in terms of income, uh, just to give you a little bit of background for, for that, to give you the sense of the size of us, um, we are lucky. We've actually got a sister company that carries out um, clinical trials for our patients uh, around the world. And they actually reinvest all their profits back into the charity. So last year we received 400,000 from them. 
Um, the rest of our income we get from company donations, trusts, foundations, and we do pretty well in legacies. And then we have traditional fundraising events, so challenge events, community. So all in all last year, um, as well as our other kind of assets, about 1.7 million. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of the effect um, that the you know situation is having on our fundraising and our income, um, I mean, we don't know yet what the impact is going to be on our clinical trial branch because of our contracts. We might be okay this year, but 2021, I think we're going to really, really see a big impact there. So it's got a long-term impact. Um, and in the short term, our fundraising deficit, um, we'll, we'll know where, you know, 250,000 we'll, we'll bring in hardly anywhere near that because our community are actually all in the vulnerable bracket. Um, and they're actually the ones that do most of our traditional fundraising for us. Um, so in terms of um, communications, um, because we're also the communications team, we've had to sort of split ourselves out in terms of getting out an important communication regarding the actual virus to our supporter base because, um, yeah, it's a really, really worrying time for them all. They're all vulnerable and they're all shielded. Um, so we've had to sort of focus on that. And then um, we made the decision to just sort of keep our fundraising communications really lighthearted to our community. So we're doing an awareness week in a few weeks. Um, and it's very much sort of very softly, softly asking them to do things like the 2.6 challenge that the marathon has launched, um, asking them to do the run 5k and donate five pounds, but it's very soft. Um, we did do a big appeal at Christmas. So as well, we, we thought it was a little bit too, too soon to be asking them for, for more money. Um, and it just didn't really sit right with us to be asking our vulnerable community for, for money at a time like this. So a direct appeal, um, we didn't, we didn't decide to do. So instead, um, a little bit like what Alex was saying, um, we, with their support, with HEDA's support, um, we've drafted um, an emergency statement explaining the impact on our services because we've had to change from obviously face-to-face -face and attending clinics, things like that, to, to doing everything virtually. Um, so explaining all the, the changes that we've had to make at really, really short notice. Um, and we wrote the appeal um, from our chief exec's point of view because he's got two boys with the disease. Um, so it's quite a heartfelt uh, statement because it's going to it's quite large companies um, who don't know what it's actually like to, to experience these conditions. So it kind of tugs on the heartstrings a little bit. Um, and we also sent out the same emergency statement um, to our trusts and foundations. So we broke our trusts and foundations up into different groups so we did a bit of prospect research so any new trusts and then we also tailored um, the statement to our existing trusts who donated to us within the last um, six to twelve months um, and we also sent out to our couple of major donors who um, are very very generous and very engaged with the organization um, again, just tailoring everything, making it as personal as possible. Um, so investing a little bit of time on, on making it really, really specific to, to where you're sending it to. Um, and, and yeah, just explaining absolutely everything. Um, and it's, it's been really, really successful. So the major donor came through, um, a number of companies have donated. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, it's proved it's proved really successful so far. Um, it's hard to say sort of what the bottom line is looking like because we're kind of reforecasting all the time and, and keeping an eye on the, the money constantly. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of things that we've learned, um, I mean, we are quite a fortunate organisation. We've got really healthy reserves um, at the moment. Obviously, this can change really quickly. But um, I think it's about being honest with your funders. Um, so explaining that, Yes, we've got healthy reserves now. Um, yes, we've got money coming in now, but but this could all change quite quite dramatically. So I think just having those kind of honest and transparent um, conversations. Um, and then also just being quite strategic with your time. So another reason why we haven't done an appeal is because it wouldn't have just got the return that, that kind of spending our time on approaching the bigger major donors and the bigger trusts has had. So being quite uh, clever with our time because most of my team are part-time and there's only a few of us. So um, just kind of being strategic where we can. Um, but yeah, we're just kind of adapting all the time and, and learning all the time. Um, so, so yeah, sorry, I kind of whizzed through that, but I hope that was okay. <laughs> no, that's great. Always, uh, always nice to be succinct. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure people have um, plenty of kind of specific questions to ask and we can, um, we can go into the details and stuff depending on what people want to hear more about um, after Matt's spoken. So, 
uh, if you just mute yourself again, Anna, and I'm going to unmute you, Matt. Um, so if you start speaking, then you should come on to the main kind of video screen for people. Okay, okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> oh, God. <coughs> I'm thrilled. Um, by the way, I'm not sure if it's a good omen or not. The Titanic on my wall at the side. <laughs> at the moment um, but it's interesting to hear what Anna has just shared because we've taken a, quite a different approach actually at BCRT although we are a very similar organisation in some ways so last year um, our accounts aren't yet ready or published for last year but yeah last year our income for the year was 1.6 million and um, I'll keep looking down because I've got loads of notes so please bear with me but um, so to give you a bit of a flavour as to our kind of audience um, the vast majority of people that tend to support our cause um, are those that have been affected by bone cancer. Um, primary bone cancer is seen as a relatively rare disease and um, you know less than 600 people a year are diagnosed with it in the UK. Um, but we're still a relatively small moving to medium sized organisation if you look at our income. We have 24 staff um, and quite a few of those are part time. So we're national but we're based in Leeds. Um, but our income last year was 1.6 million, which was up um, quite dramatically, 1.4 the year before. And we've been growing actually for the last four to five years. Now, undoubtedly, that's not going to happen this year. But in terms of our income, 24% of our income normally comes from trusts. And um, about 30 to 31% comes from community based and challenges and events represent 36%. We receive practically nothing from legacies in just program individual giving represents only about four percent two percent comes from our investments and in mem and major donor are both around one to two percent as well so we have quite a different income profile um, to anna's charity and the vast majority of people that do fundraise for us doing community-based fundraising or challenge events tend to be immediate family members of those that have had primary bone cancer and whilst primary bone cancer affects all age groups you know, the vast majority of our supporters come from the type that affect children and teenagers. It tends to be their parents that are more engaged with us. So, you know, you could say that a vast majority of our income, you know, nearly 65% of it is based on community-based fundraising methods um, and challenge methods. And literally that has been obliterated. Um, pretty much as soon as lockdown started, all that stopped. Um, we're quite unique at BCRT. We don't have a CEO. So there's myself, we have um, Zoe, my colleague, who is our head of research, information, and support, and we have a head of finance, Chris, and the three of us um, manage the charity operationally, um, and we report to a subcommittee of our board um, who give us additional support operationally. So because we have that structure, we're very, very close to the numbers, and you know, we work as a very close sort of like triangle, so we've been able to coordinate really tightly our approach to this. So, Initially, we, um, you know, we, we kind of kept our communications going. In March, we had a month of impact that was going out on social media. And then very quickly, we started to see, obviously, a lot of our activities falling off the cliff. So we stopped that month of impact. We issued a public statement. Um, I think one of the first that went out, just to you know, reiterate to our community the position that we're in. And we actually forecast a short to medium term loss of income of around 390,000. Um, we've now revised that upward towards 690. So we're expecting half of our income pretty much to have gone. And what we've done is we looked at three different forecast scenarios um, based on what we thought would be achievable or could be achievable. And we've actually decided, um, and our board asked us to work to the worst case scenario within that. So what we did, every bit of activity that we kind of had mainly ongoing, we sort of like stopped from a fundraising perspective and we regrouped and literally pulled the team together and we used that public statement that we had to con create messaging for all our different fundraising channels so um my colleague claire is actually on this call um, and you know she leads our trust and foundations work and she used that incredibly well to go to our trusts give all the existing trusts that are supporting us an update of our situation and ask them gently for an additional gift she also went to everyone that we've got a pending application with to give them an update. Um, and we, she's also been doing prospecting as well for some potential new funders. And uh, alongside that with our community-based fundraising, 
our fundraisers went out to our community and um, having prepared a new um, sort of like virtual guide for fundraising we created a whole new section on our website full of all different virtual fundraising methods and to really try to engage them off the back of the, the, the shortfall that we were facing. And we included in that the impact that we expected it to have on obviously our charitable delivery. And um, all our research has stopped. Um, sorry, I should have probably said, so for those of you that don't know, the Bone Cancer Research Trust, we have four areas of work, research, information, awareness, and support. So research has kind of gone on pause, although we are working closely with the universities to try and make sure that we'll be able to pick up where we left off. Um, but we've really focused on our support and information work and actually our support manager has been in regular contact with NHS England um, on their cancer briefings to be able to ensure that we can put out relevant information to our supporters and the community and the public on you know, how COVID-19 is impacting people with cancer. Certainly one of the things that we've seen is that those that are, our community that are still being treated for COVID bone cancer so in some cases the treatment's been put on hold or there's been pauses or delays to treatment starting which you know ultimately can be life-threatening so you know we've needed to make sure that we can make sure that the support continues um, and ordinarily we would have face-to-face -face support groups and we have a telephone support line obviously the face-to-face -face support groups have stopped now so we changed that for a virtual we have a virtual support group every week and that's growing in popularity and has proved to be really successful with people joining from um, hospital in fact. So we've really focused on keeping the support going for patients and we've been communicating that back to what would be our fundraising base as well, what we are trying to do and how they're important in keeping that going. So um, we issued our public statement actually on the 16th of March and later that week we launched this urgent appeal across all our fundraising channels so we created a Facebook fundraiser, we sent out an email um, to all our database that were active. Um, that went out from Zoe, who is our head of research information and support. Um, it was a very kind of like personal email from her explaining her fears for the situation and the current facts as to what position we're in. That was then followed up by reminders and we then sent out another one over a week later, following on from it to try and keep like a, narr a consistent narrative going. Um, we all our community based fundraisers went out to our community guys and tried to get them engaged with virtual fundraising methods um, we sent out a postal appeal and um, luckily we already had um, so we create a twice a year we create a, a free magazine for our supporters called United and we'd already got one in, in production and we'd spent a lot of money on design Unfortunately, some of the content is now not relevant because it's outdated, but actually we use that um, as a conduit to put in the urgent appeal and send it out to our supporters. And actually the response we've had um, has been really, really successful. So for us, a typical appeal, our most successful appeal, postal appeal, only raises around eight, ten and a half thousand. And that might seem high or low to some of you, but to us that would be seen as a quite a successful appeal. Typically, the vast majority give cash donations, not regular giving. Um, but this appeal is between 20 and 25,000 now. So it's been our most successful appeal yet. And actually, a bit like Anna did in her charity, we did have an, a, a Christmas appeal as well. Um, that was, again, one of the most successful appeals we'd ever done. So we've not seen sort of a, like a drop off or a tire from our supporters. And um, we've seen that people have really got behind us because we've tried to be as honest as we possibly can through all our communication methods. Um, another key thing is that we've, we, we work very closely with our board of trustees anyway and at their request we're having a weekly meeting with them to explain you know what we're doing and status basically and that happens actually at 11 o'clock today I'll be on it um, but they're fully bought into the approach that we've taken and we've had their support and they've helped us with that messaging and putting it out there so um, I suppose <laughs> The main thing I would say is, you know, we, we found most successfully just being really honest, pulling together all the efforts, making sure you've got a consistent message across the board and, you know, tweaking it just for your different sort of fundraising um, income streams. Don't get me wrong, some of it didn't work. So it became very quickly apparent that the community based fundraising just we couldn't do it, even if it was virtual home based, we were really, really struggling. 
So on the 1st of April, we furloughed four of our staff. And um, ultimately, we had to be really, really strict with ourselves and make some hard decisions. Ultimately, our staff, fundraising staff, could not generate the cost that we were incurring by keeping them on. And we weren't generating net income to go up towards our charitable activities. And in my mind, you know, that money that we're using to pay salaries has been entrusted to us by supporters. So we couldn't keep them on. Um, so we, we furloughed four then, and then the following week we furloughed another four. So we've got over a third of our workforce currently furloughed. And um, so we are really trying to, as a much smaller team, keep across our um, fundraising activities and make sure that we are going back out to these people that have said that they will help support us as best we possibly can. Um, but we have, we have had great success. So one of the things um, that we found was that one of our trust and foundation supporters in particular, um, they responded really well to the messaging about the position we're in. They were sent our statement um, and they gave us an unrestricted donation of £50,000. So we've, you know, we've raised, since this started, probably close to seventy to 80000 in that realm. Um, we have a bit of a delay in the income obviously hitting our accounts. Um, and as it stands at the moment, our accounts year to year, um, we've dropped 65% for April. So I don't know, it's going to be a difficult situation for us moving forward. It's not a sustainable situation and we're undoubtedly going to have to make changes and refine our processes. But one thing that we are making sure we are doing is being consistent with our messaging, our public messaging. Um, we're quite lucky we have a large social media following. Um, and what we're trying to do on social media is use that as our main conduit of communication. And each week we have one primary fundraising uh, message. This week it's all about the 2.6 challenge. Um, but also alongside that we have cause related messaging as well, which is our support and information service. So we've kind of, research has kind of taken a bit of a backseat um, and we've really brought our support and information work to the front. Um, and each week we will have a different fundraising message for people to engage with us. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our rough approach. We, we also, actually one thing that I didn't mention, we had a couple of things that were in the pipeline that we were developing, like um, a bit like Macmillan's Brave the Share, we had Life Shavers in the works and we kind of we accelerated work on that to bring that to the forefront to try and capitalize on what people currently need you know haircuts everybody's going to need a haircut at home and um, so we, you know we've tried to really push that and we've had some moderate success from that so far and um, but the main thing has been really trying to push the virtual and at home fundraising a lot of our supporters don't seem to think that and um, it could be seen as a challenge just to run around you know the garden and um, I mean, Claire, my colleague, was on this call. She's going to be jumping in and out of a swimming pool, a paddling pool, sorry, 26 times. And I'm shaving my hair off in 2.6 minutes. And I think making it really, really obvious to supporters that it can be really easy to support your work um, will be really beneficial. Um, I hope that's been helpful. But by all means, you can ask me anything. Great. Thanks, Matt. That was really great. Um, yeah, really interesting to hear, definitely. Um, few points in there that kind of uh, resonate with with what we've been seeing as well in terms of both the charities we're working with and also just kind of keeping on top of you know the kind of um, commentary that's out there in terms of how different the fields are doing and things and I think certainly um, some of those key things there around kind of just being really clear and honest about what's going on um, giving people different ways to support trying to make it as easy as possible um, and also, I guess for you guys as well, you were you were really quick to to respond and start communicating. Um, you got that kind of initial statement out like straight away, mm -hmm. um, and then the appeal a week later and that sort of thing. And I think definitely, I mean, you know, there have been so many appeals out over the last few weeks, including you know the kind of the big you know the National Emergencies Trust, the NHS together, and all those kind of ones. Um, so I think you know for. Um, for anyone who's not kind of getting their communications out there yet, I think, you know, it's kind of a case of the sooner you do, the better. Um, make, you know, making sure that you're, you're communicating really clearly with your supporters and you're giving them those different ways of supporting and, and just tailoring it um, to those different audiences. Um, as you said, you know, that's key. But, you know, the way you're going to communicate to trusts and foundations and organisations is completely different to how... You might communicate with your individual supporters and of course depending on 
um, who they are as to how um, how you're going to do that and what you what you feel is appropriate. You know, even just seeing the difference between Matt and Anna's organisations there, just you know, um, kind of subtle differences in terms of where their beneficiaries are at right now, and, and you know how to how appropriate it is for different organisations and you know the relationships they've got with their with their different supporters um so yeah i mean we've we've been working with a few charities working through this and it's it's something that i think is is just so important at the moment getting these communications right um so we we've actually developed a service um to help people work through um kind of getting those key details right um and being able to get get the communications out quickly and effectively um i'm going to actually just try and um share my screen i'm testing my technological skills again here so it may well not work it looks like it's working on my screen um so we've set up this um page here these handsome chaps don't work with us i'm afraid but um <laughs> there's a page here which just kind of sets out what we've been doing with people um so really as i said it's kind of it's getting that statement as matt was saying being really clear and honest you know what's the impact on your beneficiaries how are you having to change your services how are you looking after your team what's the financial impact um and then taking that kind of general statement um let's see um Good Bank Cancer Research Trust, um, you've got it pinned on Twitter, I think, that kind of statement. It's not an appeal, it's just really clear setting out the situation for you guys. Um, and then taking that and, and thinking about each of your different types of supporter, thinking about those audiences and kind of tailoring it um, to them. And as I say, whether that's kind of, you know, very direct asks to trusts or whether it's um, more kind of subtle communications with your individuals and offering them different ways to support um, and then for us it's it's getting those key messages right and then it's using the, the most appropriate channels so actually for major donors it's probably not a letter or an email or social media it's probably picking up the phone and talking things through and seeing how they're doing how they've been impacted and and if it's appropriate then coming down to make the ask um, so you know you can you can get those messages right and then and then use the right channel um, and it might be phone calls and emails and having stuff out on social media so people are kind of receiving those messages in a few ways. Um, so we've we've been helping people to turn this stuff around really quickly. You know within kind of a couple of days or so. Um, you know talking things through with you, gathering some information you send through what you've got, we draft up that initial statement, um, we make sure we're both happy with it and then we start tailoring that um, to the different audiences and can give you kind of, you know, the kind of emails and letters and things to send and the proposals and then you can use that, you know, use those key messages. Um, we've got cool scripts with little inverted commas there because I don't really like kind of scripts as such but if you're making those phone calls just having kind of the bullet points of the kind of key messages um, and that's definitely great with your kind of with your major supporters, whether it's individuals giving really big sums or whether it's actually, you know, some of those community fundraisers who might be doing things for you at this time of year normally and raising, you know, the larger amounts, um, actually checking in with them, seeing how they're doing, having those conversations. And, you know, if they're really, you know, if they're having a really tough time, then it's probably more about building your relationship with them for the long term and just, you know, checking in and supporting their own well-being um, but actually if they're okay then I think it's completely appropriate to be setting out the need for support that you guys have got right now as well. Um, so if, if anyone's interested in this it's less than 500 quid including that um, and if you're a small charity under 350k income there's a 40% discount on that so it's less than 300 pounds and as I say we can help you turn things around really quickly and I think at the moment um, you know, it's so vital that you get those messages out there and you get communicating with your supporters. And I know lots of people will have already done this, um, but if any of you have been either just so caught up in the kind of operational um, situation and working out, you know, what the hell does furlough mean and how do I go about it and, you know, what's all that stuff, um, you know, if you need some help with that, we're here to help you with um, getting those communications to your supporters. 
Um, and if you, you know, if you've not been sure about whether you whether you should be asking for funds or not at the moment, uh, we can talk that through with you. Um, but I know we uh, we said we'll have plenty of time for Q and A, um, so we're going to do some of that now. Um, I'm just Alex, gonna, yeah. Could I, just, could I just add, just to I mean, just to emphasize the fact that you know, communication we need to be as reactive and on it as possible, no matter what kind of charity you are at. And I know that certainly in the public, there may be a bit of a misconception that actually the government support that's been announced will probably help most charities. But in actual fact, I know that the majority of people on this call, the funding that's been really released and the support that's been released will not benefit you. And um, we fall into that bracket, absolutely. And that is one of the main things we're going to focus our communications on next, making sure that you know, our community aren't under that mistaken belief. Um, and, I, you know, I would really encourage everybody to really push that and get that out as quick as possible. And I think that's a really good opportunity right now that, you know, all charities should really be focusing on to try and, you know, put out the reality. Um, because, you know, the vast majority of the public do think that so charities will ride through this and they don't know the full impact. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, OK, I know there have been some questions popping up. I know um, Amy's had some technical issues, so thanks for sending questions via email, which I have obviously closed. Um, I'm going to just pop open my email so we can quickly see um, the questions, because I know Amy's been looking through and where they're, um, where some of them are quite similar, just grouping them together. Um, let's have a see. Okay, so there was a question to Anna. Um, asking in terms of those large companies that you were communicating with um, if they were warm relationships that you were already involved with them? Yeah we've been involved with them for a number of years um, we've got a large network of companies that, that support us through our kind of clinical trial branches um, and our kind of connections there um, and, and currently they haven't furloughed staff um, so it make, does make it easier to, to make those approaches yeah. Cool. And also, um, Anna, there was a question to ask, and if you have a large social media profile? Uh, no, not really. Our social media is on about 4,000 followers. Um, so, so, yeah, relatively small. Um, that's a mixture of sort of people that are directly affected and then the, the kind of the wider group. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing quite a lot of social media around our Awareness Week activities. So we'll be doing online quizzes and, and everything like that. So with a small ask for donations. Um, and yeah, the posts that we do post get, get a high engagement. But, um, but yeah, we're always trying to, trying to build up our, our awareness on social media more and more. Cool. Um, and there were a few here for you, Matt, as well. Um, so um, there's a couple of quick ones here. So the furloughed staff, were they all fundraising or comms as well or any other areas? Uh, both fundraising comms and support of care. So um, initially it was um, mainly uh, sort of like support of care and, and fundraising, but then we added comms on the second round, which was a week later. So um, in terms of comms, we have a, com a part-time communications manager and we have a full-time digital comms exec, um, as well as myself, split into two, so almost. Um, so right now we've just got a part-time comms manager and myself, looking after all our public communications. Keeping you busy, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someone asked, um, what's your supporter base like in terms of numbers? So, um, so our database, we have around 30,000, probably a bit more on, but in terms of actively engaged, it would be less than 10,000, most definitely. So we don't have the largest support base. However, the majority of the support that will, the vast majority of the support that we've received over the last few weeks has come from our warm donors. We've had very little cold support. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's the impression I get is that really you know, it's all about engaging with your warm supporters because they already care about your cause and you know, they'll, be, they'll be keen to support. But, um, yeah. but, you know, if people are looking to support a charity they've never supported before, it's going to be either their local food bank or NHS yeah. charities together, National Absolutely. Charities Trust, those kind of, you know, really direct. Uh, you I can weave in... 
you can weave in asks as well you know what we're doing we're doing like an online free mindfulness course for our community and it's led by a you know a really good practitioner and we're, we're asking for donations to take part in that so you can you can weave in different asks um for your services as, as well if it's appropriate yeah we, we've done something similar with like virtual yoga and, mm -hmm. and we've got a number of supporters doing virtual yoga which is something that actually some of our former patients can take part in as well so it's a bit of a win-win mm -hmm. you know, donations for that mm -hmm. Um, and then, Matt, we had a, a bit of a kind of technical question here about how your video fundraising works. Our video fundraising. Uh, well, um, we've not had loads. Um, so we've got we've put out some video content, some that we already had in the works, um, and we've included it with the fundraising ask. But that pretty much um, was uh, individual. So we hold an annual conference, which is just for our um, community and during that conference we had a video we have a video room and we interview patients that share their stories and um, that acts as a source of information and strength and support for other patients so we prepare those videos and release them over a course of a year we released a few of those um, over the last few weeks with the fundraising ask demonstrating that you know this is the need for our work please support and we've had quite a good response to those um, but I wouldn't say it's been the most effective I think being the most effective way of uh, engaging with our supporters at the moment has been being direct with the facts and um, yeah. really to the point with them. So um, we've got a, got an interesting question here, which has come up before, I think. Um, so how do you manage corporate fundraising when corporate contacts are furloughed? Um, <laughs> and I guess one of the tricky things that if you've only got people's professional contact details and then uh, not at work then yeah. yeah how do you how do you contact them is there any way of getting hold of them so for us um trusts and corporate are kind of lumped together and as i said it's about 23 24 percent of our income altogether but the vast majority of that comes from trusts income we have very little corporate support we have tried for a number of years to build our corporate position but with very limited success um and the some of the corporates that we have that are engaged with us are actually engaged with our we have special funds, some of you may have tribute funds or named funds, something similar, we call them special funds, and um, some of the corporate support that we have actually support the special funds. So whilst we've been um, trying to give as much communication to some of the corporate contacts that we have, the special funds themselves have also been feeding that kind of the corporate entity as well, so that's really good. So we have a number of um, sort of like families across the country who are really engaged and whilst their support has kind of dropped off a little bit during this period, they are still very engaged with us. Um, and actually, I think that's one of the things, there's another question I can see on the chat about social media. And one of the things that we've really wanted to do is remain front of mind for people. Because just like Alex has said, we're now not, you know, not just, not that we compete, but we're not competing with the normal sort of like charities and audience that we want. But, off the back of this, there's going to be local businesses that have got crowdfunding pages and you know, communities will be supporting them. So um, what we've really tried to do is make sure we are front of mind by putting out even more supportive communications, arguably, than what we were doing before this period. So kind of gone on to something else there. But <laughs> I don't know, I know if you had any tips because you've, I know you've got some corporate relationships there. Yeah, kind of yeah. I mean, we kind of um, separate our, I guess, similar to you, Matt, I kind of slot the companies, the really big companies through our clinical trial connections with our trusts and foundations. I sort of treat them all in that kind of entity. And then, to be honest, the majority of our other corporate support comes from um, our community um, working. So they, they nominate us for Charity of the Year we'll never get a cold company really supporting us um it's, it's really really hard we are quite a specific charity and, and relatively small numbers of people actually are affected in the country um so so yeah um the companies that we do have like the small corporates um we've just been having some zoom chats with them trying to engage them with the 2.6 challenge they're really really excited by that couple um that's doing it for us um and yeah just having lots of phone calls kind of um virtually where possible and just trying to keep them motivated and you know they do have plans in the future for doing sort of you know bike rides under the bright and that kind of stuff in the autumn so just trying to make sure that um you know fingers crossed they can they can do it and they can crack on with their planning um and if not they can move it to, to next year so so yeah but Kind of two separate things really the companies and then the, the smaller corporates 
Thanks. And Amy's just highlighted for me a really good question. Um, and that is, um, if you guys got any examples of things that have gone wrong in your fundraising um, the last few weeks? I mean, they might go wrong for us. I mean, our awareness week, we're doing a different activity every day. Um, so we're doing an online singing. One of our girls who, who have one of our diseases, she's a brilliant singer. We're, we're doing that live. Um, and I mean, I don't know what the level of engagement is going to be like. Um, our community have been quite quiet. Um, I mean, you know, there are always the same people that do things for us all the time. Um, but a lot of them are very, very, very nervous and anxious. And so our support team are crazily busy answering their phone calls. Um, so the fundraising side has been a little bit quiet. So, um, yeah, doing a different activity every day. We might get two people on this live sing along. We might get no one. We might get hundreds. So, yeah, I guess you just have to wait and see because it's a little bit nerve wracking. But. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've probably had about three things that are of note. Um, <laughs> the appeal that we sent out by post, we're quite lucky that we were well, quite a local um, print and mailing house uh, was in Leeds. Um, and they still managed to get the appeal out, but obviously they had issues with their staff within their factory setting. So we had a bit of a delay over getting that produced and actually out of the door, but eventually it went. That was great. The second one was around the responses. So as I mentioned, our supporter care officer we furloughed so actually um we're quite lucky that we have uh, the systems and a VoIP telephone system that meant that as soon as lockdown started everybody in the charity was working from home but we've had to rethink supporter care completely mm -hmm. um, and being able to process donations coming in and respond to them and obviously send out thanking letters and actually <laughs> it's working faster than what we were doing before which is quite interesting and it's uh, it's actually thrown up some new opportunities for us um but the other thing that we've had that's gone wrong is so i mentioned earlier it's probably good to use you know zoom if you're doing support groups or anything like that but actually um our support group we found that there was a couple of people that joined that weren't particularly legitimate and shouldn't be on there mm. but obviously with zoom you can't see people or hear them before you admit them to the group which is a bit of a concern so if you are thinking of doing some sort of um, support group or something similar that way. Just think about that. You have to be on it as, as everybody joins straight away to know whether or not they are legitimate, and if not. Yeah, well, I think with us as well, you know, we've had to do a lot more internal comms, to be honest, to get people to understand what happens if somebody phones and to make a donation. So just kind of really spell it out and make sure that people know where to direct the phone calls. Because yeah, working remotely has had its challenges. Um, there's about 30 staff in my organization. Um, that's predominantly part time. But, but yeah, there's a lot of people kind of, we don't have direct dials either. Um, so you just phone the switchboard and then it's like a free for all. So making sure people are very clear with, you know, somebody wants to make a donation, a large donation, come to me and yeah being really clear about that. Cool, I've got a few really good questions here still, so I hope we're going to get through them. Um, okay, so first of all, let's tackle this one. Okay, so any tips on how to respond over the next six months? Um, so what should be the main priority? Uh, it's hard. Uh, I thought it was, is it hard to plan ahead in uncertain times? It's definitely, it is hard to plan ahead in uncertain times. Uh, definitely, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, like my thoughts are definitely that you know one of the it's it's going to be really important in the next six months. I think it's you know we've uh, talked to a few people about you know everyone's kind of focused on the very immediate kind of emergency crisis situation, but actually uh, for a lot of people, a lot of vulnerable people, it's going to be the kind of you know the after everything kind of goes back to normal for lots of us actually that's when it's going to be really challenging for a lot of vulnerable people and, and for the charities that support them um, and in terms of the funding landscape um, but planning ahead at the moment is obviously so difficult um, when we have so so much uncertainty um, until we know when lockdown is going to end at least um, you know it's really difficult isn't it in terms of forecasting or kind of planning um, so I don't know if what if you guys have got any thoughts around that, how you've been doing that within your organisations. Well, there's a there is a question actually that I don't know if we missed it, but I mentioned earlier that we're kind of seeing our public comms week to week. Um, but originally at the start of the year, we had a planning meeting with every member of staff, and off the back of that, we created a um, 
an annual comms plan and that's the part that's kind of the window gone on hold so really at the moment we're only looking like two about one three weeks out at most because it is such a changing situation and um, planning for the best and hoping for the best um, we're bringing forward plans for like a virtual fundraising event and um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to sort of start promoting that in the next couple of weeks um, but literally beyond that we're not doing it because it is we're seeing such a up and down mm. response so it, you know it's yeah really I mean, no there are some, there are some things in our in our kind of comms plan that we're hoping will, will go to plan so the radio four appeal we're part of in that september so i mean bbc are still you know sending out their correspondence like that's going to go ahead and, and plan as normal so we've got a bit of income around that that we're hoping for um and then our christmas appeal um uh, you know the big, for the big give we're, we're part of that for the second year um so what fingers crossed we're hoping that that happens at christmas time as well but yeah in terms of comms like you say matt it's incredibly hard to, to plan yeah. out and i think for us what i'm really aware of is all of our events this year we're meant to be taking our families to euro disney we have a bereaved weekend so instead of doing those things we're going to be doing a lot more things virtually getting families together somehow and even if we do um an in memory um so we have a planting day in october um and we don't actually usually have an ask around that but this year potentially if people want to plant a virtual tree make a donation so it's kind of thinking ahead to those sort of things as well so making sure that our community can get together but also how can we raise a bit of funds as well so i'm quite hopeful that pretty much all our events have either been delayed or postponed but um we mm. have fall in november in leeds and i've deliberately not postponed cancelled or done anything to that i'm living in hope <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Ahead with that, and actually, it will act as a really good part mm -hmm. of to bring the community together at the end of the so, year. So, um, mm -hmm. cool. We're running out of time. We've got um, some really good questions coming through all the time, which is uh, it's a shame we're not going to get to all of them. Um, so we will try and follow up on um, on email definitely. Um, so what we're going to do. Um, as soon as we can after the webinar finishes we're going to get a, an email out to you nice and quickly um, just to share the, um, the link to the recording of the webinar um, so if you've missed any bits or you want to run through it again or you want to share it with your colleagues um, then you'll be able to do that um, and we've got um, all the questions in the chat so we're going to have a, a quick look at um, the ones that we haven't managed to get to um and we'll um it might be in a later email um but we try and respond to some of those once we have a bit of a think and respond properly to them um or if there's any quick answers or if there's kind of uh, resources we can signpost to and things then um we'll um we'll get that stuff into the initial email um if you think of any other questions, then just drop us an email on hello at kedaconsulting.co.uk and we'll uh, get back to you with our thoughts. Um, we've been um, running a little fundraising helpline for specific issues around um, COVID-19 impact as well. So you can um, contact us to schedule a call for that. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, we're providing that emergency fundraising comm service. So if you want to um, get a place on that then just drop us an email and we can confirm and book you straight on um, or if you're interested but you want to ask some questions find out a little bit more about how it works um, we're going to I'm going to open up some appointments um, for I think Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning um, so in the email we'll, um, we'll pop a link to the uh, appointment scheduling um, link as well so you can do that um, just wanted to make sure that I've talked through um, plans for afterwards um, and we've got four minutes left so I might just try and get a couple more questions answered. Um, Matt I know you've got, uh, your, you've got your call with the board at 11 so feel free to be late for that. a couple of minutes before. It's okay. <laughs> it's it's fine. Right in. It's it's fine. Fine. Yeah. Um, okay, let me find these questions again. Um, there was a really nice one I, I liked, so we'll, we'll try and give a couple of examples of this. So, someone was saying, obviously, it's a tricky time. Um, so, can you share a heartwarming story or a positive example of something that's gone well for you during the crisis? Um, so, I guess this could be either a fundraising thing or a personal thing or a non fundraising work thing. 
I don't know if you guys have got anything that springs to mind straight away. I think that, that for me, the lady that I mentioned when we did the virtual support groups, which is completely new to us, the lady that joined us from hospital that's currently under treatment, we never thought in a million years somebody would join us actually from a hospital setting. We've never had that before. And she really found that a source of strength and support right now. Um, you know, being in hospital is such an unnerving situation at the best of time, let alone with all this going off a floor below or a floor above or a few walls away. So, um, you know, the fact that we've still continued to really impact on people's lives has been really quite inspiring for us, I think. Yeah, same here. You know, we, we, um, we basically been asking our community to, to dance along at home and send in their videos so we can share on social media just to create a little bit of warmth and some fun and seeing all the children either in their wheelchairs or um, you know boogieing on, on the floor and as best they can um, to their favorite song has just been really really sweet um, and heartwarming um, and then also just kind of getting all the questions that our support team are getting um, so I had to collate all of that for an application they wanted to see examples of the sort of questions that they're getting um, and just you know we just had no idea um, the, the kind of questions that, that they get and they're so complicated about you know benefits and my partner has to go to work but they're vulnerable and, and you know it's, it's such complicated things that they're being asked and and just having that kind of feedback afterwards you know um that they, they wouldn't have known what to do without our support team um i think that's that's really good for us as fundraisers as well to, to hear that all the time so we know that you know why this money is so important um so that's been really good too just time, Alex, and I know you've obviously talked about your helpline, but there's a couple of specific questions. And if anybody's a, a you know, research charity or wants to contact or reach out direct, then I'm more than happy to help and share anything that we've done um, with anyone if yeah. assistance to you. Thanks, Matt. That's really kind of you. Um, thank you to you and thank you to Anna as well for um, presenting today. It's been really, uh, really fantastic to get the insights from you guys. Um, thank you to everyone else for all the questions and engagement as well and for, for your time today. Um, I know I've really enjoyed it, so I hope all of you guys have, to, have done as well. Um, I saw Amy posted um, a question asking um, what you guys would like to see if we do some more of these. Um, so I'm going to have a look through the comments and hopefully we'll do some more uh, and we'll see what other topics people are interested in. Um, but no doubt everyone's got more Zoom calls and webinars and what have you to to do in one minute's time. So I'm going to let you all go on time <laughs> and, and hope to speak to you soon. Okay. Right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Look after Bye. yourselves. <laughs> Bye.